KCSU Stanford. Welcome to Entitled Opinions. My name is Robert Harrison, and we're coming to you from the Stanford campus. As the winter solstice bears down upon us, my guest and I have descended into the catacombs of KZSU today for a special edition of Entitled Opinions, a one-time show in the midst of our hiatus before our regular broadcast resumes this coming spring. Something to warm you up at that time of year in our nation's history when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs that shake against the cold. It's a special reach out to all of you, but especially to my fellow Americans who listen to this show on a regular basis and who probably feel that they'll never wake up in a good mood again. I'm not here to put you in a good mood following our presidential elections, but to do what we always do on this radio program, to practice the persecuted religion of thinking to think in the midst of the wasteland, to make sure the wasteland doesn't grow within. The wasteland keeps growing without, and sometimes there's nothing we can do about that. Our job is to make sure that the wasteland doesn't grow within. That's why we descend into the netherworld of KZSU. That's why we keep entitled opinions going. And that's why we come to you with a Zarathustrian gift this December day, Anno Domini, 2016. Under the stars, across the ice He goes looking for his maker It's a real pleasure for me to welcome the philosopher Peter Sloterdijk to our show today. Peter Sloterdijk is the author of many outstanding works, including The Critique of Cynical Reason, The Spheres Trilogy, and You Must Change Your Life. He has spent the past month here at Stanford, and I was not about to let him return to Germany later this week without bringing his voice to all of you who are part of the ongoing conversation of Entitled Opinions. He is one of the living philosophers whom I admire the most and whom I read with real pleasure, and I'm grateful to him for joining us today to talk about a thinker who is as much a part of Sloterdijk's DNA as he is of mine. I mean our comrade Friedrich Nietzsche. There are any number of topics that Sloterdijk and I could have engaged, but we agreed to devote this show to the evangelist who in Ece Homo declared, I am not a man, I am dynamite. Do it, Freddy. Bring it down. I'm sick of dour faces staring at me from the trumped-up tower. We want Easter power in our nation's garden, not blood meal for the craven or the sullen. I apologize to my guests for talking to myself for a moment there. It's an occasional vice of mine, as you may know. And before I succumb to further temptations, let me promptly welcome him to the program. Peter Sloterdijk, thank you kindly for joining us today on Entitled Opinions. It's my honor. Thank you so much. So our topic, as I mentioned, is Friedrich Nietzsche. And I have just finished reading this splendid little book you wrote called Nietzsche Apostle, at least that's the title in English, that was published in English in 2013, but it was first uh, came out in Germany in the year 2000 on the 100th anniversary of Nietzsche's death. And I suppose I'd like to begin our conversation by asking you what exactly you mean when you speak of Nietzsche as an apostle. The answer is quite simple. Um, Nietzsche had very high ambitions. And he asked uh, an elementary question, who was the most faithful person in the history of Western mankind? And the answer he gave by, uh, by himself, to himself, uh, was that this person was obviously St. Paul. 
whom he took for the, the real founder of Christianity. So, so and uh, only the apostle, St. Paul, who is at the same time the uh, man who invented the role, the apostolic role as such. Uh, I will tell a couple of words about that, that in a minute. Uh, he was a man uh, with whom he had to look for uh, uh, for a match. Yeah, if he were really willing to overcome the tradition of classical religious uh, metaphysics, uh, he was uh, Saint Paul was the most faithful person in history, according to him. And if it were possible to do. Uh, uh, in some uh, to undo uh, from some point of view these uh, effects that Saint Paul had created, he would change the course of history. Uh, uh, according to, to to Nietzsche, Saint Paul brought genius into resentment, uh, elevated resentment. Uh, uh, up to a level from which on it could become a gospel. Uh, and that was for, for him a fateful maneuver you know, that he wanted to undo. Do you believe that the figure of, of Jesus is secondary to in Nietzsche's mind to Paul? Yes, in a certain way, yes. Yeah. He, he would rather uh, be able to live with Nietzsche than with uh, St. Paul. Uh, because for uh, Jesus, is, it is absolutely not not clear if he had a universalist message. So, yeah. uh, Jesus uh, seems to be an elitist. Uh, he talks to those who can understand, and there is not necessarily this general horizon that came into his message uh, through the encounter between the uh, the Gospels and the evangelical messages and the Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, only when the two, these two languages met is each other. And this meeting b began in, in Paul's writings and were taken up in the fourth Gospel that was written later. Uh, this meeting uh, between Hellenism uh, and uh, this uh, unruly uh, Jewish message made possible what we call Christianity. And of course, the word gospel means good news or glad tidings. And um, you make a point of Nietzsche claiming that he wrote the fifth gospel in his book, Zarathustra. And can you speak a little bit about this fifth gospel and the paradoxes at the heart of it? Because good news is something that you claim Nietzsche made a great effort to con to convince himself and to continue believing that he was actually a bearer of good news, but he was tormented by the fact that before you get to any good news, there's a terrible news, dreadful, yeah. awful news that he has to um, bring to humankind. Yeah, first of all, the category of news is such is very is is, pro is problematic. Uh, because news, in the modern terms, is actuality. Um, whereas for those who use the, the term euangelion in, uh, in, in former times, or in the original scene, uh, when the, uh, the message arrived, it simply meant message, or in German, Botschaft, you know. Good, yeah. the, ang the ang angelion angelos is uh, is just a messenger that, that, is, that is important and the connection with time is not yet so clear uh, not, not that actualistic by the way uh, Nietzsche had not yet uh, studied the so called Gnostic uh, gospel say well uh, discovered later on in ancient libraries and also for by this uh, astonishing uh, <coughs> vessels, uh, uh, these foundings in the desert of, of, of Egypt, what we call Nakamadi, co the codices co 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 of, of Nakamadi. So now we know uh, among the scholars uh, who deal with uh, the 
wrote a field uh, of text in which the so-called New Testament is, is located. That there have been has been a, a whole genre literaire that we call Gospels. Uh, there are at least 30 to 40 that we know in, in, in our days. And, and out of this corpus of uh, 44 survived. Yeah. Right. Uh, St. Mark in the beginning. Uh, uh, <coughs> that was the, the eldest one. Uh, but see, the robe was t- turned around. The editors of the New Testament put Matthew in the, in the beginning, and then the, uh, was Mark and Luke. And the last one is, 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 is John, the, the Greek apostle. That is very important because uh, with him, the Hellenization uh, of uh, the Jewish message uh, started. So uh, the, the, the number five that uh, Nietzsche used uh, f- uh, for uh, his, his own writing contains a claim that he had done something what should change the further course of religious history because he pretended he had introduced laughter into, into the, uh, the good news. Yeah. And there is something to be laughed at and, uh, and there is some uh, deep uh, hilarity uh, in, in wisdom even if it has to be gained through a, a long tunnel of sad and, and horrifying knowledge that belong to the modern condition you know, because modernity is all about disillusionment it is a period of, of dawn of a, of a long protected darkness we all live uh, in a kind of uh, mist uh, and dust we, we cannot have very uh, wide ranging views you know, because we live in, in, the, in the middle of this, this dust of deconstruction of the metaphysical uh, traditions and you believe that Nietzsche knew that we were in the modern era, we were somehow uh, obliged to live in this tunnel and this dark times for a considerable time to come, and that his gospel is going to speak to us on the other side of these uh, of these times. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, I, I'm grateful for this beautiful coincidence that you use this, the sound of a dynamite ex, uh, ex- explosion. Yeah, uh, for Nietzsche's times, this sounds uh, sounded very Helvetic. Yeah, it, it, because Switzerland was was the, the country where the uh, first heroic efforts w- were made to to penetrate. Mountains yeah, and to create tunnels and to create a new new ways to get to the south. Yeah. That is the uh, metaphysical question for right. all these northern uh, uh, people. The essential, the essential essential question: How can we win back an easier access to the Mediterranean truths? Yeah. And, and right. these uh, sw- uh, tunnels in, in, in Switzerland, yeah. Uh, as it were, fulfilled uh, um, an important role in, in the history of, of modern culture because they offered the, co- the connection. By the way, uh, the connection between Greece, uh, between, between Germany yeah, and Greece, between Germany, <laughs> Germany and Greece, especially. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so British uh, uh, stopped uh, mostly at the Alps uh, because they were the co-inventors of, of uh, alpinism and that. Um, might suffice for their uh, ambitions because they were fond of the of the so-called sublime, the second uh, great category of modern aesthetics. The ocean uh, was already at hand for them. They had they, they had it immediately before their their eyes. But uh, the Alps needed a certain uh, travel effort, and that's what they did. Yeah. But for the, for Germans, you know, the tunnels that led. Uh, to the south yeah, were a more essential uh, question and to, to uh, uh, gain back free access to the truth that lay uh, beyond, beyond the Alps seen from the north that, uh, the, the Italian truth uh, the, the, the Mediterranean truth and then the, the, the really big dream 
essence. Uh, sure. And w in Nietzsche's case, he seemed to have a, a, a very direct tunnel to Greek wisdom early in his life. And I don't know how he did it, but he seemed to have the dynamite with him, and he bore through the, the you know the Alpine range right straight to Greece, and seemed to have um, not had to go through the same laborious process that some of his predecessors, like Hegel and the others, had, yeah. had to go through. Yeah, uh, he had a, uh, a channel uh, or a tunnel before the channel was built uh, through his en encounter with R Richard Wagner. Uh, who was in his way also uh, a tunnel maker, uh, who, but not to, towards the Mediterranean troops, yeah, but for these Nordic inspira inspirations. Yeah. He wanted to, 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 to the Northern Gauls come back on the tragic, tragical scene of, of, of Ger German theater. Yeah. That's why he, one day, in his uh, <coughs> later work, he, he, he created this extremely demanding concept of the Weihefestspiel that should replace the classical opera. In English, that would, uh, could be rendered approximately by sacramental festival. Yeah. And the people should go to, to this meetings in the same habits as they went to a sacrificial uh, setting of an ancient um, r ritual. Yeah. Yeah. And that should went, uh, go even further than the Catholic Mass, yeah, where also the, the, the body of the Lord was, transfig was transfigured and, sh and shared with the community. And here also a different knowledge of the truth of suffering should be distributed to an elite audience, uh, a new German, a new Germany. So new, you, new music for new ears. That was the formula uh, of uh, of this uh, later Wagnerian compositions. So you also authored a book about Nietzsche called "Thinker on Stage: Nietzsche's Materialism," which is. It's in-depth analysis, reflection on Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy, mm -hmm. which, as we know, is dedicated you know, to Richard Wagner, where he makes a connection between the Greek stage and Wagnerian music. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess for our listeners, would you say, do you, do you think that Nietzsche had to do some special pleading in order to make the substantial connection between Wagner and the, and the Greeks, or whether... Um, whether there was something about the Greek tragedy that that was not exportable to the to the northern mists of Wagnerian, um, the northern gods of Wagner. Yeah, in the, in the first place, for, for, for Nietzsche, war, the encounter with, with, with Wagner uh, was really good luck because it allowed him to to connect. The Hellenistic studies, uh, in, in which he was a, a young specialist, uh, and where his his uh, ge genius uh, manifested itself for the first time. This encounter uh, with Wagner was a lucky one for him beca because it allowed him to jump directly from Germany, from Thüringen to Athens, uh, and, and he, he had a direct access to the great. Dionysian theatre uh, in, in in Athens, and he was a privileged uh, visitor to that place. Yeah. And uh, f from Wagner, he Im imported uh, that message of a, of a new, of a new seriousness uh, to music and uh, and culture in in, in general. Uh, because the, the German opera was a light opera at the time. You know, it was a kind of uh, operette, uh, what do you call it, operette. Today we would say mu musical, all the opera, the classical opera, opera buff. Uh, but Wagner, he had learned that uh, seriousness or heroic music must move away from the entertainment principle. And here he, he could, could connect very easily with the, the Greek uh, metaphysics of theatre because the theatre was, was made to allow a large audience, you know, 
uh, in an ideal case to the co complete male co uh, population of, of, the, of a big city uh, to be present when uh, the suffering of God himself uh, are, re are rep represented and to, and to, to, to look at the uh, <clears throat> dismembering of, the, of Dionysus and, and see how his suffering recreates this, uh, the world and makes a new form of social synthesis possible. Yeah? Because all uh, experience uh, the, the, the same drama. Yeah? In an ideal case, all would cry at the same moment. Yeah? That's, that's the, the moment of, of, of truth in, in this shared uh, uh, spectacular pres presentation. And, and from there, people return home as after a catharsis, this, in, in, uh, this cathartic moment uh, of, of, the, of the Greek drama became very important and remained important for, for Nietzsche. So would you say, Peter, that the, the message of the uh, Nietzsche apostle already begins with the birth of tragedy and his thinking about Greek tragic wisdom? and Dionysus and the death of the god on stage and the, me the meaning of suffering. Is it already announcing itself in that early work? I think so. Uh, he himself wrote uh, an introduction to the second edition uh, of this book yeah, that appeared still in his own lifetime and also in, in, the, uh, in the, the last clear days. Uh, he, he had because uh, uh, he lost his self-control uh, when he was f 44 years old. And this is eventually the best piece of philosophical prose he had ever, ever written. It's a new introduction yeah, because he's extremely self-critical. But in one aspect, uh, uh, he still has a, respect, uh, a kind of uh, admiration for the young man who did this book, yeah, because he, he, he still pretends that this young author was the first one to ask uh, the question what Dionysus or Dionysus yeah, really could mean to us. Yeah. And he, he, his whole life work was, as it were, uh, just a huge effort to unfold these meanings of a new encounter with the coming God. Now, that was the attributes that already the ancient had given to uh, Dionysus. He was not an inmate of the classical uh, Olymp. Uh, he, he was a non-Olympic God, he, uh, someone who came from the, from the East, all accompanied uh, by a bunch of, uh, of wild personnel, uh, uh, men and women alike, almost always drunken, mm -hmm. carrying flower crowns in their head, and he himself riding on, on the back of a tiger. Yeah. So with, uh, with these images uh, before your eyes, you, you see that this advent, and it's because Dionysus is just as a Christian, An Jesus, yeah, a God to come, he, he has an advent, and all new theology is uh, about the question, how should we understand the temporal structure uh, of this arrival that pretends at the same time to, to be already a presence? Mm -hmm. So something is to come and something is, is already a presence. That is the reason why uh, Nietzsche became later on especially in the Zarathustra, the singer of a metaphysics of the high noon. You know, because uh, this uh, stillest hour, you know, when the sun is uh, in its zenith and the world seems to stand still and is, 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 is perfect, the God must no longer move, he's already there, and you withhold your breath and and try to, to become a fair witness to the miracle of, of being. Of the actual presence there of 
of, of the God or whatever sp- divinity one is referring, either Dionysus or the um, the epiphany of, of Christ is also in presence, but it's also to come at the same time. So there's a strange temporality. So Heidegger mentioned somewhere, I don't remember where, he says that after the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche did not write any more books. He only wrote polemics. And that the birth of tragedy is really his only bona fide book mm-hmm. in the sense that it presents an argument. In the preface that you were referring to, the later preface, Nietzsche is extremely self-critical, as you say, and he says that the this author should have sung rather than spoken. And yet I, f- I have a very different um, impression of the birth of tragedy because I find it extremely sober, well reasoned uh, book that that lays out evidence for its arguments and attempts to uh, present a, a rather coherent thesis that can be tested mm. uh, either empirically or historically or philologically and so forth and that um, I, I think that it, we would have lost a great deal had Nietzsche sung this rather than actually reasoned out the arguments for who Dionysus is and who Apollo is and how they come together. I think that Nietzsche is right to a certain extent uh, when he says, my soul should have been a singer rather than a a, a writer. Uh, But uh, what he did in his later days was exactly that. Because uh, uh, it's something that I sometimes said about my, my book so uh, with my ordinary voice I'm a baritone but as a writer I'm a tenor yeah. mm-hmm. and that is that is absolutely the case with, with Nietzsche and that and this uh, remark of, Heid, uh, of Heidegger hits uh, uh, really a, s- a sensitive spot but not for the disadvantage of, of, of Nietzsche uh, because when he turns his back to this that field of uh, propositional prose, uh, putting one uh, reasonable se- sentence uh, af- af- after after the other. Yeah, he he starts uh, something that c- can be understood as a, that maneuver uh, to confront the uh, effects uh, of uh, this world history of resentment that are linked to the victory of Christianity as uh, the official religion of the Roman Empire. So, uh, to a certain extent, it is true that uh, everything else uh, after the birth of tragedy were, were polemical. But it is necessarily polem- polemical, just as all writings of, of, uh, of St. Augustine you know, uh, were not sober writings, but prayers. Yeah? So uh, there, there is a model literature. Uh, a mod- all, all, I would say it's a mod- the modality yeah? or the genre plays an uh, equally Im- important role for the un- understanding of, of writing as just deciphering the propositional content uh, of, of a written text. Yeah. So, as a philosopher yourself, can I ask to what extent you consider yourself an heir to Nietzsche? And uh, by heir, I don't mean a pious disciple of Nietzsche. I mean someone who has inherited the um, the thought and the corpus and has metabolized it and has, uh, you know, given it new life in a new time as such. Yeah, so that brings us back to that apostle problem. How can a, a contemporary author be a messenger uh, without really knowing by himself uh, what his message can could be? Yeah. This is, uh, sounds uh, a little bit weird, yeah, as if I were an employee of uh, so of a post service uh, that rings at at, at the door. 
of a receiver and say, uh, I should have a message for you, uh, but I have, I have forgotten that halfway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, know, I, I find that there are some distinct messages in your work, but nevertheless, yeah. yeah. That's true, yeah, but, but, but because by and by there is the effect of the, uh, how should, should I call this, the, the, the labor of experimenting with, with truth. Yes. Uh, and finally, they condensate into an established corpus of convictions. Yeah. And convictions are things you, ca you can repeat without uh, being bored by what you sa say by yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, also the, uh, the apostle discovers at the same time that, that kind of speech uh, that is not afraid of repetition. No. Everywhere else, uh, everywhere else where entertainment is, is concerned, repetition is deadly. Uh, uh, but f as, as when it comes to the question of, of convictions uh, that are the result of uh, uh, long med meditations, uh, new messages c can arise, uh, and you, you can, can get to the door of someone. But these convictions, uh, convictions and these messages are different from the authoritarian messages uh, former apostles carried on. There's a very nice parable by uh, Franz Kafka uh, that Max Brod found in his diaries and that goes approximately like this. Uh, they were brought before the alternative to, to become kings or messengers. You know? According to the nature of, of children, they all wanted to become messengers. And, the, and therefore, they are running through each other and shouting to each other their meaningless messages because there are no kings. Yeah. Yeah. And they would like to put an end to their miserable lives, but they do not dare due uh, to their allegiance to the message. Yeah. That is that is Kafka, and I think this is the uh, in in, fi in five lines so the, the metaphysics uh, of the modern c communications as such, because uh, everywhere are the, 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 the messengers who share their mutual voice uh, with each other. And very rare are the authors uh, who, who at least have a, a minimal message. Well, here's a question <clears throat> about whether a message has to have a king uh, who is dispatching it, or mm -hmm. whether there has to be a god for whom one is acting as a messenger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can one be the messenger of, of something like the predominance of ressentiment, resentment in mm. human modern behavior, mentality, and so forth? Or can one be the messenger of uh, something that Nietzsche worried a lot about, which is our, um, our, our culture in the modern era especially, <laughs> is seized and possessed by a will to truth. And this will to truth at any cost is something that without us knowing what we're doing, we are uh, uncovering one truth after another, which is showing us that there is really nothing it, behind the um, uh, the things that we are uh, investigating, and that this will to truth will end up demoralizing us beyond any hope. These are messages that one can actually deliver yeah. to one's fellow men without there needing to be a king behind them. Is it not the case? Yeah, but... Uh that is, that is the case. And the problem is how to transform this message in a good use. Yes. That, that, that's the problem. Yeah? And, the, and that's the point where uh, the, 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 the critical transformation of deception in, into good use happens. Uh, that is uh, Nietzsche as a, uh, the writer of the fifth gospel. And this too, uh, we uh, we have been leaving this uh, era when uh, we lived under the metaphysics of a strong sender. 
Yeah. Yeah, that, right. And that every uh, important message was supposed uh, to, to, to carry the signature of a divine or su at least su superior force. You know, so. Now, deconstruction ha has happened, uh, not necessarily under this, this name, but it, it, be, it started at least in the 17th century when uh, Spinoza started his mockery on uh, what he called historic religions uh, and uh, religions depending on, on, on priests and on this caste of specialists for holy things. Uh, and this mockery uh, went on for uh, at least three centuries and what we have now are, are this, this killings in, in Paris to, to the fact that the people of Charlie Hebdo uh, were daring enough uh, to, to print some harmless uh, caricature of, of Mohammed. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the thesis uh, sender bound forms of, of religion where, where everywhere the signature of Allah is at the end of the document uh, of the documents. This send up, uh, send about kinds the kinds of, of messages that they are in our days are fighting with the, with the different kind of, uh, of message, which is virtually m more and more the, the message uh, of the uh, artistic transfiguration of true of of unlivable truths. Uh, and I think that, uh, that Nietzsche also can be read uh, as someone who tried to to make these uh, unbearable truths bearable by instilling uh, so a new element of love uh, into into the message you know? and this uh, and this love resembles to a certain degree to the eldest conceptions of ancient philosophical theology that you can find in in Aristotle you know? The God necessarily is that entity who deserves most his own love. The, the whole uh, truth about philosophical theology is uh, the absolute narcissism of God. You know? And that makes us so, so critical about Nietzsche, because he entered, for, for our taste, he entered too, too deeply. Uh, into that realm of of, of necessary self love of the God who uh, meditates his own godliness, uh, and we we feel embarrassed when we read uh, Nietzsche's uh, so self eulogies and right. uh, uh, and we we look at uh, at the sign and feel ashamed a little bit one feels a little bit ashamed for him because we uh, besides him you you hardly ever meet a person who has a, such a high opinion on, on, on himself well yes in fact you you quote a number of passages in uh, Nietzsche apostle which are extremely embarrassing but you know when one is read nietzsche you get you almost get immune to them because you, you as you say we we deal with our embarrassment by either um putting aside mm. these passages or finding explanations for them whereby they don't really mean what they say but can can i quote for our listeners just a few of these uh things that he would say about himself Here's something that, he'll, that he writes in Echeoma, I believe it's Echeoma. The fact that a psychologist without equal is speaking in my works, that is perhaps the first thing a good reader will realize. Another passage, does anyone at the end of the 19th century have a clear idea what poets in strong ages called inspiration? If not, I will describe it. This is my experience of inspiration. I do not doubt that you would need to go back thousands of years to find anyone who would say, it is mine as well. My Zarathustra has a special place for me in my writings. With it, I have given humanity the greatest gift it has ever received. And I could go on quoting yeah, many yeah. passages that you draw attention to. And here you, you, you do relate this self-aggrandizement to the divine narcissism, as well as many other kinds of narcissism. You speak of ethno-narcissism when, you know, they, the Franks in the... Ninth century believed that they had to find a, a to um, 
translate the Gospels into into their own language, yeah. and many other ways in which by praising God, the praiser is also always involved in an act of self-praise, no? Yeah. Nietzsche not only unveils that, but then takes this uh, in, into an extreme in his own public uh, performances. Yeah, but uh, uh, from a architectonic point of view, with regard to the opus, the written uh, opus as, as such, uh, this divine narcissism is the precondition for that what Nietzsche called his uh, deep idea, the, that is uh, the teaching of the eternal recurrence of, of the same, yeah? because uh, these both forms of circularity have to meet in order to to make both of them plausible. So if uh, in the world always the same thing happens, uh, even in, in huge circles that an individual knowledge never can go fully go through. Uh, but if really all the all times the same happen, but the individual who is who is in the middle of the, pro the process or caught in, in in the process will either be just uh, a grain of, of dust uh, in that uh, infernal mill that turns eternally. Uh, but if in that same uh, full circle the self-love of, of Dionysus, Dionysus, Dionysus here, who loves himself uh, with, with, with the, the, the love of, of, of a being that knows and creates at the same time, yeah? who has found a way to combine suffering, knowledge, and, and, and creation. Yeah? And then these both circularities can carry the world process. And then this megalomaniac discourse becomes, as, as it were, a necessary proof for 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 the for the truth of that essay, yeah. but finally we do not really know if Nietzsche really wanted uh, that his uh, <coughs> theorem of the eternal recurrence of the same should be taken au pied de la lettre or, or seriously, yeah. because when he introduces this idea, uh, he speaks hypothetically. Uh, he, he says. Uh, how much would you have uh, to become a friend of yourself? And how much would you have to fall in love with life in general if you were ready to, to carry these heaviest idea of all thinkable ideas, which is that everything will happen again to, and you will be exactly come eternally back again as the same person yeah. and if you and if you could say yes to that obscene pro proposition that everything sh should hap happen again yeah. Yeah. Uh, without the intervention of a no <laughs> right. then, then these both uh, uh, circularities could meet but I wonder if Galovit was right when he when he took uh, that theorem of the eternal uh, recurrence as the same, literally. I don't think it should be taken literally. It is a test, as it were. Right. It is a test, and uh, it should show you how far your uh, energies of aff affirmation can go. You know? He himself was uh, made sometimes very funny remarks. Uh, uh, for instance, when, when he said, I am very inclined uh, to drop my uh, strongest idea of the eternal account of the same when uh, I imagine my mother and my sister. Right, yeah. right. that's true. <laughs> when, it, when things become specific, it's more yeah, difficult. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah so... Th th there is, I believe, something in the onto-theological tradition, if you want to use a Heideggerian concept for it, where the divine is, has been conceived from Aristotle onwards as coincident with itself, identical to itself. It is that which must necessarily love itself. Uh, Nous has that 
quality where it thinks upon itself. In Dante's uh, Paradiso 33, the very last canto of the Paradiso, when he looks right into the Godhead, he sees the Trinity smiling to itself, on itself, through itself. Uh, so this sort of principle of identity would almost require this, the kind of divine narcissism. And Nietzsche then seems to be very aware of it and perhaps at, at certain times suspicious of it. I'm reminded of one of the first mad, semi-mad letters that he dashed off after his collapse in Torino, in the city of Turin, mm -hmm. when he wrote to... Um, Jacob, to Burkhardt, actually, oh, Burkhardt. Mm -hmm. where in, in his in his first paragraph, he, he writes, uh, this is January 6, 1889, Dear Professor, in the end, I would much rather be a Basel professor than God, but I have not dared push my private egoism so far as to desist for its sake from the creation of the world. You see, one must make sacrifices however and wherever one lives. Yeah. And this idea that it would be better to be a Basel professor than God seems to me to suggest that there is there's something infernal about that that uh, that God's entrapment with his within his own megalomania, and maybe a modest Basel professor uh, uh, yeah. is somehow more sane than God. Maybe, uh, uh, but for us it is uh, very hard. Uh, to conceive a sane God, uh, yes, uh, but by exactly. being God, uh, by being being a, a God uh, that creates that much inner tension, and all the great systems uh, of uh, philosophical theology dealt with that inner divine turbulence. Uh, for for that, Neoplatonism, for instance, is nothing but a, a huge description of that turmoil that is uh, going on in, in, inside uh, inside the, the space of divinity. God remains always in himself, but he explodes permanently. He He's recollecting the particles of this explosion and brings them back to the center and so, and so forth. So that's, that's the system of, of Proclus. Uh, that found a, an amazing afterlife in Hegel's uh, system that also is uh, caught in the rules of that absolute circularity. Uh, and fr from that point of view, Heidegger is right to reintegrate Nietzsche into the, the, the history uh, of ontotheology uh, and to uh, see in him a thinker uh, who delivered an explanation to the two uh, strongest ways of self-manifestation of, of the divine will, uh, uh, the will to power uh, as science or as technology and the will to power as, uh, as art. Yeah. And in Nietzsche, do, uh, can I ask you, Peter, if you agree that there is a, a certain, um, there's a philosophy of shattering of uh, as Dionysian uh, urge to self-immolation and self uh, self undoing, as you were describing in the case of the turbulence of of God in even more traditional notions, but that this urge that Dionysus has to, in his moment of presence, his epiphany, th that moment of presence eventually will and and very quickly turns into the dismemberment of that God. Be precisely, mm -hmm. perhaps because there is some liberation from this narcissistic trap within which the concept of the divine uh, yeah. often often is found finds itself. Yeah, Nietzsche, Nietzsche himself, himself uh, sometimes tried uh, to get out of this full circle. You know, in the Exo Homo, you, you, fi you find amazing passages where, where he says that he personally, for, for, for his, his own psychological reality, uh, he never had a will. And he's, as a person, uh, <clears throat> not able to say what it, what it means to, to be really willing this, this or that. And this, this, this is a precious hint. And the most beautiful part of Sartre um this high noon scene in the fourth, in the fourth uh, part of, of Zarathustra, which actually is a, a kind of European answer to the moment of enlightenment of the Buddha under the Bodhi, Bodhi tree. You know? uh, here, he, 
describes the messenger as a, as a person sleeping in in the grass under under a tree and tied to life yeah, only through a very thin uh, thre thread. Yeah. You must not not move. Yeah. Dionysus is, is is there. Don't even breathe. Don't 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 move. The world has become perfect. That, that shows that he he's looking for the moments when he was able uh, to to bear the burden of of his divine predicament. Uh, yeah. And what do appearances or surfaces? have to do with this in the sense that at the end of his life, I mean, and at the end of his thought, he does go back to the Greeks and he, he, he says uh, at the very last page of Nietzsche contra Wagner, for example, which he was working on before in, there in Turin, he talks about our future and he says, you will hardly find us again on the paths of those Egyptian youths who endanger temples by night, embrace statues, and want by all means to unveil, uncover, and put into a bright light whatever is kept concealed for good reasons. No, this bad taste, this will to truth, to truth at any price, this youthful madness in love of truth have lost their charm for us. For that we are too experienced, too serious, too gay, too burned, too deep. We no longer believe that truth remains truth when the veils are withdrawn. And then he goes on to say, that aren't we now, after we've been through these depths, are we not coming back to the, to the Greek wisdom? Are we not Greeks, adorers of forms, surfaces, colors, tones, everything that has to do with the divine superficiality of appearance? And when I th think of those moments of the high noon, that where the world has become perfect, there's two things about the noon that I... I would like to propose to you, see if you agree. One is that the high noon is not the moment of maximum revelation where mm. the world is, is revealed, but it, it's also the hour at which there's a great deal of concealment in appearances because of precisely this excessive brightness and this stillness. Mm. And it's when the animals are actually in hiding and so on. And that this acceptance of that which does not reveal itself or that perhaps which you cannot penetrate to the truth of might be part of the experience of the high noon or at least an accept an acceptance of the limitation that uh, our phenomenological ways of being in the world uh, bring uh, with them does nietzsche at the end come to a a kind of need to to create a kind of renunciation of this mm -hmm. strong will to um, become the divine, seize the divine, mm -hmm. or be in the overwhelming presence of the divine. There is a moment in later Nietzsche's life when he addresses his, his future readers, asking them uh, that first of all, they should not mistake him for something he had not been. Right. You know? uh, that is his... Uh, first and last uh, hope not to be uh, uh, mis mis misunderstood uh, as the founder of a new religion. You know, he said, uh, the, the title of, uh, I am pretending for is that of a fool or a poet. Only fool, only poet. I think uh, it is a wise decision to take that as his as his last word when it comes to the question of of self of a self portrait. Yeah, together with Act uh, we arrive at, at this ambivalence. And <clears throat> and the truth question can best be interpreted by the hint that the noon uh, for uh, Nietzsche is. Uh, is an occasion to repeat uh, the divine siesta after the, crea right. after the creation. Yeah. You know? And there are uh, two types of stillness come together. There is an oriental element in, in, in Nietzsche's reflections. It is a silence of the Buddha who sat three days in deep silence under the body under the body bomb because he had understood there is nothing to say no, nothing to do and only out of a secondary gesture 
uh, of, of pity, he descends and uh, decides to become a teacher. Uh, but this, uh, teaching is always something that is not propelled uh, by a manic mission. Yeah. Well, that's but, when we go but, back to the Basel professor. Yeah, the that's what he, yeah the, Basel, the Basel professor uh, is a, a, a hidden Buddhist yeah, who said, uh, it's... Uh, and a teacher, too. Yeah, and teach, teaching is also a, 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 form, a form of pity because you see that uh, so many people, people are still living in that... Uh, a bad form of tur tur turbulence and that are not sufficiently familiar with that double stillness uh, of the European uh, siesta mm -hmm. and the Indian meditation. Right. Peter, can I ask about Zarathustra is a, uh, is a bewildering testament and Nietzsche had in Ece Omo and elsewhere had what some people consider a, a kind of insane overvaluation, overestimation of the importance of that work um, among all his other works. And um, I know that you and I share a love of that book, uh, not for its overt sentimentalities or other things, but because it seems much more, uh, there, there's a lot going on under the surface. And can you say something about how important you believe that one book is in the corpus of Nietzsche yeah I think it is, it is the book in, in, in which he uh, <clears throat> makes his coming out uh, as, a, as a writer of a new t type of autobiography on the surface you would say he tries to do something that could only be done uh, by a third person, you know, just as it needed a Thomas f f from Celano to write the Vita of St. Francis. You know. right. uh, but he, I think he wanted to be uh, Celano and fr uh, Francis of Assisi in one per person yeah. and to become the, the, uh, uh, the, the writer of a, of a Vita, not a, not a modern autobiography, but the Vita is. A, so you think it's more a, of a Vita than a, than yeah, a gospel? Yeah, it is closer to, uh, to the Vita, so the, uh, a saint's life, yeah, the, the, the record of a saint's life. Uh, it should be uh, collected within a, a new volume of the Legenda Aurea, yeah, right. where. Uh, the uh, modern characters uh, could be brought, brought together in, the, in that co collection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and these are <clears throat> uh, reports on, on heroes and saints who were able to reappropriate their, their own work. Giltai, yeah. by the way, was a man who had said uh, the man is an autobiographical animal. And the very possibility of of uh, historiography depends on the fact, the human faculty to to bring the elements of your life story to, together and to arrange them in such a way that you get an autobiographical self. But this is a modernism. I think Nietzsche here clings to an, an outdated and much more heroic form of writing a, a, a vita. For instance, this passage is uh, on his own work. Yeah. This is to simply reenacting with the tradition that already was in the antiquity uh, uh, a well-known habit that scholars, to the end of their lives, uh, wrote a book on their books. Uh, Liber de Liberis Me. This is a, a classical genre. Yeah. Nietzsche knows that, and he takes it up. The most famous uh, example of that, of course, were the retractationes uh, that uh, Augustinus wrote uh, when he looked back on, on his uh, former writings. So there's a, a lot of classicism in that uh, Act to Homo. Yes, that's Ecce Homo, of course. And in, but Zarathustra, here's uh, another question I, I, I very concerned to ask you. I, I, f I find that when it comes to Nietzsche being a prophet, there are ways in which he was 
for me, extremely blind about what would be the most dominant feature of the coming century, which he, many people consider him the inaugurator of the 20th century. But the one thing he has almost nothing to say about was the uh, dominance of modern technology in the era to come. And this, okay, you, you can say that he didn't, this was a blind spot in his thinking. In Zarathustra, especially in part four, however, I think where he has a prophetic vision uh, that has to do with our, still our own time, is when he's speaking, when he thinks of the the last men, this uh, idea of who is the last man, in what way is the, the, the parameters that the last man is, is, is contained within, which is very much the consumerist of our own society, which is the complacent, uh, it's, it's, not, it's no longer even the petit bourgeois or, or these 19th century categories. It's very much the contemporary citizen as a global citizen of a, of a kind of uh, capitalist system of, of consumerism that does not think beyond its creaturely comforts of this day and the next day. And, the, and this is where I think there's something in his thinking that promises to, to show us a way to transcend this fatality, which is European civilization mm. after all these centuries and millennia, and it, that it cannot end in the last man, or will it end in the last man? I think here uh, in, in Nietzsche appears a major problem that will occupy the humanity in the centuries to come. Uh, and that is the question of how to maintain that what I call the vertical tension inside the, the human being. Also, all, everything that has to do with verticality, for, for that Nietzsche is a thief specialist uh, you know, uh, coming fr from the tradition because he dis discovered this new type of problem, how to maintain the, the, the vertical tension if the higher region uh, itself has been re removed. Uh, yeah. This is uh, as if uh, uh, Jacob's ladder, yeah. you know, over which the angel can uh, march up and down, uh, well, in was, fact, yeah, uh, should still stand upright without having a support on the upper uh, level. So there, there is still height. But uh, there's no support, su support from above. So everything ha has to be erected from, from below. So the vertical tension has a, a, a rocket-like uh, di dynamics or a, a will to growth. And that can be easily expressed also in biological terms. You can go back to Goethe who said that all life is movement and extension. And for, from here, you get to a, a less me megalomaniac co conception of growth, uh, as you, you can, could retranslate uh, Nietzsche's exaggerations uh, in, in the language of, uh, of human growth, which is still a, a, an, impo an important and, as I would say, an immortal uh, idea for also for generations to come. Well, in fact, you in Nietzsche Apostle, you speak about his uh, extraordinary genius as a marketer of his own brand, and that he and, mm -hmm. and that you don't merely invent a brand that then takes off in the market. What you do is that you create the market for the very brand that you're promoting, and that mm -hmm. Nietzsche uh, created a market for a brand of. I think it's related to what you're talking about. The latter of having realized that in the era, in the regime of the last man, which is a regime of egalitarianism or mass, that there will always be a need for distinction or a drive to distinction and that his, he marketed his, his philosophy as a promise to, as a way to uh, understanding a need before it even became apparent to the world itself yeah. that there was going to be a need for distinction in in this world and that he was but then you also say somewhat um, I think prophetically that he was promising losers a formula by which they could be on the side of winners yeah. and 
this was also part of his brand. Uh, th can you say something about this? Do you, do you see, when you speak about verticality, are you speaking about this need for distinction that will be among uh, people in, in this particular regime? I think uh, Nietzsche was among the very rare thinkers who had a feeling for that. There is a deep connection between moral, moral, moral philosophy and public relations. And this can be shown by the subtitle of the Zarathustra, a book for all and nobody. A book yeah. für, für alle und keinen. Uh, and I'm convinced that this is uh, Nietzsche's genius. This subtitle betrays something from his, uh, his inner, innermost drive, uh, his way of uh, polemics, as Heidegger would put it, uh, was not really polemics. It, it was teaching. It was a kind of action teaching. Action teaching, like Joseph Beuys would would call his his performances. Uh, Nietzsche was a, a kind of action teacher, writing a, uh, a book for all and nobody, and discovering in so doing the very structure of of higher morality because this kind of morality only creates a field of behavior uh, that is not descriptive for a living population that but traces the horizon into into which new generations uh, will will rise in in resonance with this uh, Input. The input has necessarily to, to be a, a challenge, you know, just as Buddhism was before, before, before it was brought out uh, as the Indian form of a, of, a, of a gospel or the way of salvation, you know, just as Christian, Christian gospel uh, was a, a, a pure challenge you know, to the uh, pagan environment. Uh, of the for, former world, and and so Nietzsche uh, de de designs uh, a, a horizon for, for for those who, in the morality market of the, f the future, uh, uh, will distinguish themselves as individuals who who, who show how the, the path of humanity can be continued. And in that context, you, you read the, the, this uh, most provocative sentence of the uh, introduction, the so-called so prologue to the Zarathustra. The man is a rope between the animal and the superman. You know? And uh, you decide if you want to be a successful rope walker or not. Right. You know? And... If you are not successful as a rope walker, you, know, uh, you have tried it. You know. And that is just the meaning of this uh, philosophical pantomime that c concludes the prologue of Zarathustra. He sees a rope walker, he, he has fall, fallen down, and he says, you made the danger, out of danger you made your profession. There is nothing despisable in that. And for that reason, I am going to bury you with my own hands. Right. That is that is Kasatrus's message. Uh, it's not success uh, that decides everything. It is the will to to remain within the movement uh, and to walk on on the rope. Uh, if you not if you do not want to. Uh, remain simply a part of the masses who are looking up and admiring people doing crazy things. Right. Well, that's, uh, that's beautiful because it brings everything back into play that we've been talking about over the last hour, which is, above all, th th what is the message? And if that's Zarathustra's message, um, that being on the tightrope and being suspended between two different points, maybe being a messenger without... Um, you know, the sender in view, either behind you or, or in front of you, 
and this idea of living dangerously I, I, that is also a parable for the kind of thinking yeah. that yeah, yeah. your work certainly um, embodies in uh, all sorts of ways and a kind of message of dangerous th dangerous thinking as you put it in uh, your in your work in Jean Genet you f you find uh, a passage when, where he said just remain a messenger of the rope messenger of the rope that's good that's uh, a good place to conclude our conversation that we've been having here with our professor Peter Sloterdijk, who's been visiting here at Stanford in the past month, offering seminar on his work. And um, grateful to you for coming on again, Peter, for this conversation about Nietzsche. And when you come back to Stanford, and, I, and I'm trusting that you will come back very soon, we can uh, get back into this underworld studio of KCSU again and uh, continue this conversation on other uh, topics as well. So I want to remind our listeners that you've been listening to Entitled Opinions. I'm Robert Harrison. We're on hiatus at the moment, but we're going to be back with you in the spring. So thanks again. Thank you.